what is a climate change crisis? A crisis, by definition, is intense trouble or danger, a critical point in history, a point at which decisions must be made. Climate change is the gradual change in global temperature caused by the accumulation of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. We are making war on the integrity of this planet. The human population <coughs> explosion of recent millennia, accompanied by exploitation of fossil fuels in recent centuries, have moved this planetary system out of a dynamic equilibrium. We were planted in this garden to care for it, literally to have dominion over its creatures. Dominion means caring for our island home, the oikos, the home that gives birth to economy and ecology. This is housekeeping and husbanding work to care for what sustains us all. A crisis is a decision point, a time of judgment. We can choose to change our destructive and overly consumptive ways, or we can ignore the consequences of our actions and slowly steam like the proverbial frogs in the soup pot. We still have some opportunity to choose, but that Kairos moment will not last long. We have before us this day life and death. What will we choose? Here in this diocese, we're taking direct steps to take and have a program called Seeds of Hope and have it abundantly producing food for the poor and the hungry and the disenfranchised. That program also teaches us how to build urban farms so that many, many people can be fed in a small, small plot of land. You are caretakers of this society. Anywhere you are in the world that you watch this, you can make it happen where people are encouraged and uplifted and taught how to be caretakers of our society. Here in this diocese, we started a program with the Reverend Andy Barnett. We hired him to be a chair of environmental science and of food justice at Campbell Hall High School. But he's attached to all the schools in this community. We have 44 schools and he's building a curriculum so that they can examine their part in caretaking for society. We're hoping to do away with morbid obesity and food deserts in the inner city. We have Tim Alderson who's working with us here and leading a program of 11 interns to try to teach us how to care for their our needs of food in the inner city. The state of California and the county of Los Angeles are working with us to make this a reality so that no one goes hungry without fresh fruits and vegetables. I want you, no matter where you are in this world, to follow the lead of the Episcopal Church. Follow the lead of that great woman that is our leader, Catherine Jefford Shorey, and follow the example of this diocese where we take small plots of land and make them abundant gardens. What are some of the ways when you've, uh, where you've uh, seen the effects of climate change already? Um, well, Alaska's, I mean, in the Arctic in general is one of the fastest warming places um, on the planet. And so we're seeing that the melting of the uh, ice sheets, we're seeing um, our glaciers are disappearing. Um, the permafrost is melting. Um, coastal erosion, we have entire communities now that are having to be relocated, um, wildfires, so some of the, many of the same things that um, other places around the world are, are also feeling, but the intensity with which we are um, experiencing them is very great, it's massive. The question is, do our actions make a difference? And that's a really simple one to answer, because when you build a fire, when you run your car, you are putting carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And the human population has grown exponentially. Therefore, the number of people doing that has grown exponentially. Our lifestyles have become more energy intensive. And, and so our energy use is growing exponentially. The one thing that's not growing exponentially is the size of the planet. And we're treating our atmosphere as our collective sewer 
And you know, if there's a very small village, you can do that and it disappears and you don't have to think about it. We've done this to the world and we're all living in our collective sewer. You look at Alaska, we're in quite the conundrum because our economy comes from you know, the oil and, and here 95% of the entire north slope of Alaska is open to oil development. You have this remaining 5%, which is the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. It also happens to be the calving grounds for the porcupine caribou herd, in which end we call it Ishikwatsangwandaikotlet, which is the sacred place where life begins. And to me, that's it's a symbolic place too for the world of how do we treat our last wild places on this planet. Really, there aren't any at the end of the day. Our thirst for um, burning fossil fuels is going to trump protecting these last, you know, wild, intact ecosystems, which we need, not only us, but our children and our children's children in order to exist. Probably the biggest effect for Southern California is going to be the increase in excessive heat days, days where the temperature gets above 95 degrees Fahrenheit. And an estimate that, they, you know, in just I'm trying to remember, I, I just saw this, I think it's like within 30 or 40 years, we're going to have an increase in two months worth, an extra 60 days of excessive heat in Southern California. You know, it's about action. I mean, I love the idea of like the 30 days of action. People get the information and then the next question should be, what can I do? You know, what can we do in terms of, you know, advocacy? What can we do when we have, you know, elected officials who aren't really <laughs> even acknowledging you know the term or that this is happening then utilize your voice it you can you can, anyone can pick up the phone and call your senator call your representative and bring those issues to light whenever and wherever possible yeah. we have one of the best largest groundwater basins here in the San Fernando Valley it's why LA annexed the San Fernando Valley was to get the aquifer underneath it um, and then we proceeded to contaminate it with jet fuel and we cannot use that aquifer now. One of the largest sources of water in the state, and we can't use it. So let's clean that up. That's actually in the water bond that just went through. Um, Mayor Garcetti is trying to get some of that directed towards cleaning up that aquifer. And then we can try and take our storm water and get it back into the ground, which is a wonderful storage mechanism, instead of throwing it out to sea. People who have been residents of California longer than 10 or 20 years when you couldn't see the Verdugo foothills when you were standing right in front of them because of the amount of air pollution here, the work you have done in changing the parameters of the fuel we consume in the summer and winter gases, we really have made exponential improvements in air quality. So I think that might be a great example of what we can do when we have the political and moral will to change these other areas that are connected to climate change as well. I mean, it's not a foregone conclusion that we're done. Right, and change can happen. Yes, and, and it is the example of the uh, fight against air pollution that has uh, given us both the courage to say we could be an example as California for other parts of the world, and that is bringing people to California. Every week we are now uh, escorting, entertaining, talking to delegations that are coming through from, uh, from Asia, from both China and India, from Latin America, the Philippines, wanting to talk specifically about how we dealt with air pollution. Uh, and again, it's primarily because they're seeing the rise of air pollution in their own uh, countries, especially in their major cities, not so much because of global climate, but they get it that there's a connection there between the vehicles, the fuels, the technologies we use, and also uh, human health and the global health. We are in new moral territory. We're in new moral territory. It, it, there's never been a moment when the whole earth would need to reduce. When we would all, there are no non-combatants, and there are no uh, innocent people, and they're all innocent, and they're all combatants. I mean, this is a new, a new condition. It's also what uh, is being called a long emergency. So this is not a five-year war. This is a 150-year engagement. Can you point to any specific areas of the Bible or the New Testament specifically where we can point to that and say, yes, part of God's plan was for us to be better stewards of the planet? 
Um, I think that every religious tradition that I know anything about uh, has uh, an element to it of um, humanity recognizing that we are subject to God, not the other way around, and therefore uh, when we do something that massively disrupts uh, God's creation and God's plan for us, we have a moral obligation to do something about it. The idea that we can just keep uh, turning up the uh, thermostat, keep driving whatever we want, you know, keep extracting from the earth in the way that we have this idea of limitlessness is an immoral position on the earth. And the scriptures teach us to limit ourselves. The idea of the Jubilee was uh, not only to restore people who had lost their possessions, but was also uh, to limit our consumption so that the earth could have a Sabbath, so that we gave the earth its own Sabbath, which actually recognizes the place of the earth in its own relationship to God. Who needs a Sabbath? The people who can worship God. So the uh, Leviticus passage even recognizes that the earth is a person, as it were, and that we need to limit ourselves in order to give it its space. Uh, Rowan Williams said about 15 years ago that there are um, now, there is now a consciousness of global problems, and thus you need a communion to be able to address problems that go beyond national borders. So that's what I would hope we would do, is live beyond our congregations, live beyond our own individual circles, do it well, live well uh, as an individual, live well as a parish or a local area, but live well as a diocese, like LA is doing, like California is doing, like so many of those represented here, and live well as a church, and live well as a community.